Welcome and aloha. I'm Mark Schlav, the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today we're going across the sea to Kansas City to talk about Afghanistan. The United States involvement in Afghanistan has been a strange journey. For 20 years, the United States has been at war in Afghanistan. We've heard very little about it in the daily news. We have been in a very dark and seemingly endless tunnel. Now, the United States is withdrawing from Afghanistan and it seems like we are still in a dark tunnel, unsure where it leads. Today, my guest is Professor Raj Bala. Professor Bala is the Brennison Distinguished Professor at the University of Kansas School of Law. He's also a senior advisor with the Denton's Law Firm and a Bloomberg On Point columnist. He is an authority on international law and the author of a textbook on Islamic law. Professor Bala recently wrote an On Point column for Bloomberg Quint about the history, current events, and future of Afghanistan. And I've asked him to shed some light on this journey. Welcome, Professor Bala. Good to see you. Well, thank you. Aloha. It's a pleasure uh, to be here with you, and I'm humbled to be in uh, uh, your midst and in uh, amidst a, a wonderful library of, of programs that you've been offering over the years. So, thank you. Well, you're 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 very welcome, and we, you know, we, if you're ever in Hawaii, please uh, come by. <laughs> I will uh, take you up on that. Um, now, you know, I, I want to ask you, you. You wrote a very interesting column, and a lot brought a lot of ideas and thoughts to my mind about Afghanistan and the withdrawal of the United States. And I want to kind of start at the beginning a little bit and, and briefly, what were the goals of the United States? What were the, and what were the costs of and lives and money? And what was the result of the invasion of Afghanistan by the United States? What, what was that all about? Well, that, it's, it's several great questions in there. So start with this, start at the beginning, what were the goals? Because the goals shifted over time. The initial goal follows immediately the uh, September 11th uh, terrorist attacks, September 11th, 2001, which of course were the worst attacks on uh, terrorist attacks on United States soil and resulted in the loss of um, roughly 3,000 uh, people, uh, Americans and, and, and citizens from other countries who had worked, for example, uh, in the World Trade Center. And uh, attention uh, quickly uh, focused on Osama bin Laden, uh, the head of Al Qaeda um, and uh, his uh, uh, other le uh, Al Qaeda leaders um, who were uh, thought to be in Afghanistan and indeed were being harbored by the then ruling Taliban in Afghanistan. And so um, the thought was well, we need to um, capture um, and bring to justice Osama bin Laden. Uh, and the uh, first go of that was uh, right after the uh, attacks um, to try and get the Taliban, persuade them to hand over Osama bin Laden. Now, the Taliban refused to. Uh, he was their ally and, and not a recent ally. He had been, and his al-Qaeda movement um, had, in effect, helped the Taliban uh, come to power uh, roughly during the 1996 to 2001 Afghan civil war. Uh, the um, uh, uh, Al Qaeda movement had um, provided, if you will, additional military and extremist ideological firepower for the Taliban. Um, interesting story. Um, in in March two thousand one, uh, I was in Pakistan uh, visiting uh, one of my former students and giving um, talks uh, in Pakistan, and um, uh, I, I visited my uh, former student's father in law. Muhammad Sadiq Kanju, who had been the foreign minister of Pakistan under uh, the government of Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif. And um, we talked about Osama bin Laden in, in March of 2001 because the US wanted him in connection with other terrorist attacks um, that had occurred in, in, in East Africa uh, and uh, uh, the USS Cole. Off of, um, uh, in the, in, off of Yemen. So um, uh, he said to me, uh, Foreign Minister Kanju, he said, you know, I, I went to Kabul 
and try, on behalf of the Pakistani government, which had been asked by the Americans to get Osama bin Laden uh, turned over to the Americans. And you know what I heard from the, the Taliban? I said, no, what? Uh, and he said, do you know where we first met Osama bin Laden? What was the answer? And Foreign Minister uh, Kanju said, the Taliban said, we first met him in the United States Embassy in Islamabad. He sure. was your guy. In other words, he was part of the movement, Osama bin Laden, um, to help overthrow uh, Soviet and Soviet-backed reg uh, regime before the Taliban and help unify the country. And now you say you want us to turn him over. Um, well, uh, uh, fast forward, in July 2001, uh, Sadiq Kanju was assassinated by a uh, Taliban who came across the border um, from Afghanistan to his uh, uh, house, his country compound in Bahawalpur, the state, in the state of Punjab. And as he was leaving the, the, the compound, was shot dead in the hail of bullets. During the brief time we had together, among the many things he taught me, uh, one stood out. He said, Raj, uh, I have negotiated with many people uh, around the world on behalf of Pakistan. The Taliban are the hardest. And to be honest, they have rocks in their heads, um, which is you know, really undiplomatic language. <laughs> um, but I relay that story because it all started with the effort to apprehend and bring to justice the man responsible for the 9-11 terrorist attacks. And, and, and who, who are the Taliban? I mean, what, what, why did they have this uh, a relationship with Osama bin Laden? So the ta Taliban means students. Uh, Talib means students uh, in, in uh, 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 Pashto and in, in Farsi. And they were, they were students who had gone to um, madrasas, Islamic schools, in various parts of the world, particularly in Pakistan, uh, sometimes in other, other countries. Um, and uh, they, they were students of um, so-called Islamic scholars. And um, their, uh, uh, their goal was to unify Afghanistan in the post-Soviet era, after the Soviets withdrew, um, under the banner of what they viewed as Islamic law, the Sharia. Now, their creation is really due to the ISI, the Inter-Services Intelligence, that is Pakistan's intelligence agency. Uh, former Pakistani President per Pervez Musharraf and other senior leaders of Pakistan have basically said, yes, uh, we, the Taliban are our creation. We nurtured them. Uh, we supported them. Pakistan's interest in Afghanistan was to have um, an Islamist, a unified Islamist government uh, uh, based in Kabul that um, was not friendly to the Soviet Union. Remember, in the Cold War, Pakistan was much more of our ally uh, than, than the Soviets. India was more the Soviet ally. Um, and the, 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 the Pakistanis thought that they could create the Taliban that would then come to power and that uh, Pakistan would have significant leverage over, um, over the Taliban. And thus, it could secure, in effect, um, the, the country to its immediate um, west. That proved uh, unsuccessful for Pakistan. Pakistan's long overestimated its influence over the Taliban. But that's how Basie was created. And it was created with the, um, both the, the support and the neglect of the US. After the Soviets withdrew in, in, in 1989, and then the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, and we had won the first Gulf War, no one in the US wanted to make a, a, a case for continued intervention, even by proxy, in Afghanistan. And I, I would commend to, to all of our uh, viewers, um, Charlie Wilson's War. It's a great movie that makes the point about the abandonment of, Af of Afghanistan. So uh, all of this happens with um, the, the tacit support, sometimes explicit support um, from the U.S., the, the growth of the, of, of the Taliban, 
and then uh, just its interest in, in wanting to be involved anymore in Central Asia. So the uh, the goal uh, ultimately of the invasion by the United States of Afghanistan was to get Osama bin Laden and the other terrorists that had caused the 9/11. And and what 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 did what did that cost us? What what uh, what was the result of that invasion by the United States? The result was uh, uh, roughly, uh, and, and the Beyond Point article gives you the exact tally, um, uh, but roughly uh, 3,000 uh, American service personnel uh, killed, um, and uh, a, a, a few tens of thousands, uh, upwards of 30,000 uh, wounded, uh, untold numbers of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and uh, those are only the US casualties. Um, uh, the, um, an, our NATO coalition partners, Canada, for example, um, uh, 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 the, the Danes, um, the British uh, lost uh, many lives also uh, and, uh, and suffered many uh, wounded. And then uh, on the Afghan side, uh, one recent study um, suggests that upwards of 45,000 civilians uh, were killed. Um, and then approximately 3 million um, displaced across the border to neighboring countries like Pakistan and Iran. And then another several million uh, internally displaced uh, Afghans. Um, so very high uh, human count, if you will. And then in terms of um, budget, um, you know, the numbers range depending on what you're counting from, you know, eight or 900 billion to a few trillion US dollars um, spent across the 20 years uh, from October 2001 uh, till, you know, basically now when we're, when we're leaving the country. So a lot of, uh, a lot of money, a lot of people, uh, and displaced and, and killed. Uh, and the question is, I want to know who won and uh, what happened to the Taliban? Well, the ta uh, let me take the second question first. Uh, as we, the Taliban are, are uh, by their claim, which is not necessarily a bad claim, they are in control of about 85% of Afghanistan, the territory. Um, this weekend, uh, they launched uh, attacks on um, three, uh, two, two southern and one southwestern province, uh, and, and that includes um, uh, names that are, are reasonably familiar uh, to people who've been following this war, um, Kandahar uh, and Helmand uh, and Herat. Um, Kandahar was their um, uh, initial capital when they came to power in 1996 before they shifted it to Kabul. Uh, they also, <coughs> excuse me, are said to be in control of about half of the country's approximately uh, 300 districts, and they have uh, threatened Kabul uh, itself. Um, I will predict, and I'm not happy to predict it, I, I will predict, and the column gets into this a little bit, that the Taliban will be in control or nearly in control of all of Afghanistan, including Kabul, as early as this Christmas of 2001, and probably no later than about 18 months from our conversation. So they have not gone away at all. Uh, they, are, they are headed towards power. Well, I, I, I mean, I'm having a hard time with this. How is it possible that the strongest military force in the world, the United States, at least that's what we're led to believe, was unable to defeat the Taliban. And, and why have they been able to survive and, and, and apparently sur thrive after 20 years of war? Uh, and, and that connects to the, your earlier question of who, who won and who lost. And I think, I think we have to be honest and say uh, the United States and, and NATO did not win uh, the longest war in American history. Now, your question, why? Um, there, there are multiple reasons, um, and and I, I I don't want to be um, um, you know pretend I'm an expert uh, on this, and I think time will teach us more. 
one of the reasons I think, one of the, one of the factors that is not a reason is our, if I may say, good-hearted effort. Many of the um, uh, special operations forces and other military forces um, that I had the pleasure of quote unquote teaching, they taught me a lot. Um, I, I learned firsthand uh, about their, their work, their civilian affairs work, their work on nation building, if you will, setting up banking systems um, uh, in Afghanistan. I, I learned that they would go back on three or four deployments to the same remote villages in Afghanistan and meet with the same tribal elders, sit down in a circle on the ground, cross-legged and have tea with them, to build warm relationships, build community. Um, it, it, it's, it wasn't for lack of effort. And I think as, as, as the war got on, ground on, we got smarter. We, we understood that um, uh, this was not going to be a military solution. It was going to be a political and diplomatic and relationship one. And you heard our forces speak much more about relationship building. And I think we did that. But I think initially, um, one of the mistakes we made was um, uh, an ignorance of history. We go back and study modern Afghan history from the, the time of the what's called the April or uh, the Saur Revolution in, in 1978 that ultimately led to the Soviet invasion. Um, and then the, the legacy of the history and, and problems the Soviets faced. I think we would have had much more pause. Um, I think we also um, did not know enough about Islam itself. Uh, many um, military said very uh, honestly and, and with melancholy, um, when we were sent to Afghanistan, we didn't know Sunni from Shia. And if I may say, we were, we were taught the only thing is don't shake the hand of, of, a, of a Muslim with your own left hand. And this was scandalous, Professor Bala, that, that we didn't get the proper training we needed, education. Now, of course, we wised up quickly, and we, we did start doing that training. Um, so I think that was that that's a, a, was a contributing factor is rushing in without really understanding the the landscape and the culture. Um, you know, I think um, a, another uh, a problem was um, we didn't appreciate um, the failure of governance um, uh, that had brought about the success of the Taliban, infrastructure development, uh, water, uh, power. Um, when, when we would go in and drive the Taliban out of a particular district, including Kandahar, um, then we would say, then leave and uh, uh, re uh, the remaining soldiers at, that we trained, Afghan government soldiers, um, would, would be left to hold the, the, the line against the Taliban. But where was the, the, the infrastructure development going on that the, the people yearned for? It, it reminds me not unlike of the situation in Lebanon, where um, you've got um, the, the popularity of Hezbollah and you say, why? Well, if you've got essentially a failed or failing state in, in, based in Beirut, there's gonna be a natural gravitation towards people who are keeping schools uh, uh, open, though the Taliban hasn't done that for girls to be sure, um, and building roads, et cetera. Um, so that was, I think, you know, part of the um, uh, a, a problem here. Um, and I think still another problem was, as you referred to, we are the most uh, overwhelming military force in human history. But look at what we had. Um, we, 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 we could, could we have realistically, and this is a rhetorical question, obviously, use tactical nuclear weapons in Tora Bora? I mean, no. Um, uh, we, we had air power. But this was a completely different terrain um, that called for a different, it was asymmetric warfare, to use the technical term. Um, and we, we were not really that good at that. We, we, were, we had to, to learn by doing. And then still another reason, I think, is if you take us back in our minds to September 12th and 13th of 2001, when we're trying to say, all right, 
uh, this this happened. And uh, Osama bin Laden, as President Bush identified in this speech, uh, is is the, is the a man wanted. Um, we didn't think through whether or not we could view the mission as a law enforcement mission and thus deploy a small number of intelligence, law enforcement, and special operations personnel, or view the mission as a military invasion. We never, we never really were presented with that choice of law enforcement versus war. Um, now, I'm not saying that the, the debate would have gone out in favor of law enforcement. In retrospect, it would have been nice to have thought that through um, more carefully. And critics may say, look, we tried the law enforcement. We tried to get the Taliban to turn them over. We had foreign ministers like Sadiq Kanju uh, try and bring uh, Osama bin Laden uh, to uh, American hands, and it didn't work. Um, but, you know, and reasonable minds can, can differ as to whether or not we, we, we could have done more before going down the war paradigm. You, you mentioned that you had some involvement in teaching about Islam. What, what was that about to, to U.S. forces? Is, is that correct? Yes, I was, I was blessed. And I, 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 I truly, I feel that way. Um, in, in, in 2009, 2010, uh, at the Command and General Staff College uh, at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, which, as you may know, is the Army's elite training facility. Um, for its special operations forces, the Rangers, the Green Berets, uh, and also brings in uh, some of the special ops from other uh, branches, Navy SEALs, Air Force Marines. Um, uh, uh, the the, the uh, 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 Special Operations Command basically approached me and said, um, would you like to um, teach a course in, in Islamic law? And I had been teaching that course since coming to the University of Kansas in 2003. Again, when I say teach, I really mean a student because scholars through the centuries have spent their entire lifetime um, studying Islamic law. And, and ironically, Islamic law was sort of my other specialty. My focus had always been on international trade law. Um, and we can talk about how those two sometimes come together. It's rather interesting. Um, so uh, when, the, when the army asked, I'm like, yes, I would love to do this. Um, so for 10 straight years, uh, I would commute over to Fort Leavenworth um, and we would do the uh, a three hour session once a week on Islamic law. Um, and it was it was just so meaningful, uh, aside from being a great, you know, um, uh, intellectual experience there. There I am in front of the women and men who are keeping my free speech safe, allowing us to do a program like this. Um, and we'll go back into the theater because what they were all doing was they had all been posted in Afghanistan and or Iraq and or other uh, theaters in Southeast Asia, for example, um, where they were fighting Islamist extremism. And then they, they were selected as being the best of the best special operations forces. Um, and they would get a year to come and do a master's degree in international studies uh, at the University of Kansas. And my course was one of those courses uh, that they could take. Um, and um, uh, so at the same time, uh, I was finishing up the first edition of my textbook in Islamic law. And I owe them, again, a great uh, uh, debt because they helped make the textbook better as did a number of my, my research assistants at the University of Kansas. And now, um, as we speak, I'm working on the third edition of that, that Understanding Islamic Law textbook. And it became, through no plan of my own, it was literally, you know, thanks be to God, um, the first textbook on Islamic law written by a non-Muslim American legal scholar. Uh, and I'm sorry, you, 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 you mentioned that that was important for it, us to learn about Islam. Why is that? Why, why was it, why, why in, in the military operation, why, was, why were these soldiers, why was it important to them to, to be taught that? They weren't taught it originally. 
Yeah, you you know, it's the old uh, Sun Tzu art of war, know your enemy. Uh, mm. it's a problem that the French faced in Dien Ben Phu in 1954. They didn't know that who they were fighting. And we made the same mistake in Vietnam. We thought of Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Cong as, as all about communism, when in fact they were very much about nationalism. They didn't want foreign powers um, in Vietnam. And likewise, the Taliban didn't want any foreign power. And uh, um, so that's one reason, just know, know the enemy. Second reason, um, it, which, which became clearer as the war uh, went on and as we started searching for peace, the peace agreement that we ultimately signed, and we would have fascinating conversations about this in, in the Islamic law class, is are there any Taliban, are there any Islamist uh, extremists, ones with whom you can deal? Are they all irredeemably radical and will for sure die for the cause? Or are, they, are there some who are more moderate with whom you can um, uh, deal at a bargaining table as we did in Doha uh, and come to an agreement? And that ability to try and look and in a way empathize, not sympathize, but empathize with the other side and see that they're not monolithic and that there are splits within them. And that ability then, if I may say, to exploit the splits in America's interest and work with moderates, that's something that requires an understanding of Islamic law because the splits are typically based on doctrinal differences, not just ethnic differences or political differences, but doctrinal differences about the Sharia, about Islamic law, about how you read the Holy Quran, or how you interpret a, a, a statement from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So we have to understand how they're thinking, to understand who's aligned where, and then whom we can reach uh, the, 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 uh, out to negotiate with. Let me ask you one last question here. We, and that is, you, you know, you, you mentioned that the learning uh, about each other is important. In, in the America, it seems like uh, the Trump administration and the Biden administration both agreed to get out of Afghanistan. Why was that? How could they, uh, why, what, what, is, what brought those two uh, seemingly opposing uh, uh, groups together? realized that this was um, uh, an unwinnable war and that just as um, the uh, uh, one of the uh, presidents of uh, the uh, Republic of Afghanistan, Najibullah, had begged the Soviets to stay and the Soviets said no, uh, um, uh, then uh, Mikhail Gorbachev um, said no, um, the, the presidents Trump and Biden realized that if we were to say yes and commit um, to indefinitely, um, it would be um, uh, in perpetuity. There, there'd be no, there'd be no endpoint, and America would continue to spell, uh, spill uh, 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 blood and treasure. Uh, and I'm not sure we would have been able to hold the coalition together. Um, and the fact is this, um, and, and and it's worth exploring this a bit. The, 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 our coalition partners and the Trump administration and the Biden administration, quite rightly in my judgment, viewed that the bigger strategic threat to the United States is currently China. Um, and so it was important to liberate America's um, uh, human capital and economic resources and pivot them out of Central Asia and into the Indo-Pacific uh, region, um, where we are now confronting um, an in increasingly aggressive China, as I think you all very well know uh, in Hawaii, with you've all heard terms like the nine dash line. You've seen recently what's happened with the national security law in Hong Kong, even uh, being used to uh, with respect to the Olympic games. Um, so, uh, I think both the Trump administration and the Biden administration said, no more of this endless war. 
the nation building won't work. It will be uh, an endless quagmire. And we really have uh, bigger, a bigger uh, military strategic issue to, to deal with, and that's China in the Indo-Pacific. And, and I guess my, my final question, I think I know the answer to in your on point column, in reference to the 20 year invasion by the United States of Afghanistan, you asked, was it worth it? So what's your answer? That, that's the hardest question. And, and the, the column tries to leave it to each of us to make that decision. If we make the decision based on utilitarian philosophy, which you and I have been basically uh, conversing on, um, and you look at the, the costs, you could make the argument, no, it's not. But then let me give you a radical view, uh, not necessarily mine about US history. It came, it came out of a school of historians based, I think partly in the University of Wisconsin, called Empire Theorists, who said, look, the US is an imperial power, and just like we need to exercise our muscles so that they don't atrophy, we need to continue to exercise our military to keep it world class. In that sense, Afghanistan was quite an exercise, and we developed a lot of um, techniques and intelligence and strategies, etc. If we take a different philosophical premise, which philosophers call deontology, that we, we judge and act for its intrinsic goodness, and we ask, you know, was it worth it? Was it intrinsically good to invade? Was it intrinsically good to conduct the operations that we did? I have a hard time answering that because I know there were so many, as I said, good hearted people from our side who were trying to do the right thing and their, their behaviors were good. But on the other hand, I can't easily say that invasion is good in itself, um, that it's morally justified. So uh, I, I think <laughs> I'll leave it at that and say that I'm still pondering your question. Well, uh, I greatly appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us, and hopefully we can get out of this tunnel and see some light somewhere uh, in all of this. And I appreciate you. Thank you very much, Professor Rajbala. I uh, thank you for being my guest today. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha.